Cool. Um, so thanks, Christina, for joining. So we'll do quick introductions uh, on this. So this is a, a biweekly fireside chat that we do at Amplitude with the product team, um, where we kind of invite different kind of leaders, executives, uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs uh, from diverse perspectives to kind of share their founding stories and uh, lessons learned in different capacities. Um, so for those of us, for those joining here today, uh, Christina is a serial entrepreneur and investor in the security and SaaS space. Uh, she started in economics at Stanford uh, and then joined venture capital at Union Square uh, before transitioning to Dropbox where she led the paper team. Um, the product team is a big Dropbox paper user here at Amplitude, uh, especially for, for a lot of presentations. Um, we might get some questions about things about that maybe from, from the folks. <laughs> totally happy uh, to try to answer them. Yeah. Um, uh, but she's now the founder and CEO of Vanta, which is a security startup, which is automating compliance for SOC 2, HIPAA, ISO requirements, and which recently came out of like stealth. The, I, don't, I don't know if you call it stealth necessarily, um, but, uh, and now has over a thousand customers and $500 million valuation. So thanks, Christina, for joining. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Um, so to start off, so we'll do a couple of questions between ourselves uh, right now and then about 30 minutes and then we'll transition to the audience as they ask questions as well. Um, but yeah, so you're obviously a serial entrepreneur and investor from Nebula, I think was the original one, to <laughs> Paper, to Vanta. Um, so obviously you've done a lot of different different kind of products. Like how do you choose the problems that you've worked on? Uh, like what's like what drives that innovation? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um and Vanta actually pushed on this in kind of a maybe interesting way. So when I'm thinking about just like what I'm poking at or working on myself, um, also had a lot of side projects and like things that are sort of just learning projects. Anyway, that's just straight curiosity and interest. Like there isn't even a like, is this a business lens on it really? It's mostly like a, do I find it interesting lens? Um, and so, so most of your companies start from a side project? Uh, Vanta wasn't, um, no, nothing I've actually worked on. So yeah, this is, I think the flaw of that model is right. Like very curious person can find many things interesting, many of which are interesting and terrible businesses or just like not businesses. Um, so, uh, Vanta was a little more like, what is the problem to solve? It's probably problem focused. And there we actually got to like security and then you're like, well, how do you get people to care about? care about and prioritize security. Cause I actually think increasingly people care. Like it's not like, oh, I'm a bad person and want to leak data or like, oh, I'm a lazy person. It's, I got 47 priorities. And so like making sure the doors and windows are locked is number 20, which means it won't get done anyway. And so like Vanta was around, how do you solve that? But for myself, straight curiosity, uh, one of the other ways that Vanta pushed on this is when in kind of 2017, we were trying to decide if this was like actually a company we would start. And the question that ended up being really helpful between my co-founder and I was, how do you feel about recruiting for this company? Um, Cause at least for me, right again, I will like go down whatever rabbit hole so happily, so happily. But then when it comes to like going to someone else and being like, hey, I think you should quit your great job at Dropbox and come work on this boondoggle. Like I freeze up. Um, and so that actually ended up being a really helpful filter for things. So it's basically that if you can't, you have to be able to convince someone else with integrity yeah. to believe, and that's what you felt was a catch-all um, for all the other things. Really helpful, yeah. Because I mean, again, lots of things I find interesting. Where you're like you should definitely not leave your job to work on. Yeah. You know? What was um, the what, was there a process by which you went from interesting idea to uh, like passing the recruitment test? Yeah, and I mean, honestly, it was probably four or five months. But so when we started, actually, so initially, the very early days of what's now Vanta, um, we were going to make, we had this like product vision thing, which was we're going to make a microphone that records all your conversations and dumps them into Slack. So they're searchable and you like, get oh, like, stuff. like gong and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Except for your like product team meetings, like all your meetings, but like, yes, gong without a use case, <laughs> one might call it. Um, <laughs> we spent a few months on that. Uh, you know, it worked out how you imagined it worked out. And then we're like, wait, 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 we did this all wrong, right? We went like product to problem, not problem to product. So then it was like, okay, no one's allowed to build anything. Can't, can't touch code. You just got to go talk to people about their problems. Um, and picked a few areas. So this was early 2017. So my co-founder picked kind of uh, machine learning tools. 
So like TensorFlow had just come out, like seemed like there was stuff going on there. Um, I picked security because I was naively curious and team collaboration tools like Dropbox Paper because I was like, look, if I understand anything, it's questionable on its own. But if I do, it's probably that. Um, and then it was like, okay, just go interview people, figure out what the problems are, try to like problem solution this thing. Um, but that was the very early days with those three spaces. Got it. So, and then, so you focused on the areas that you feel you had some domain expertise on um, in that context. How did you then move to the next step, which was um, understanding that this was actually a viable business um, or like, uh, so you did the process of like no code, just do user interviews. How did you know amongst those three or four different routes, which one to focus on? Yeah, so we did the user interviews piece. Um, and with the kind of machine learning tools, we basically got to, there's stuff here, but it's like really unclear. Will it be open source projects? Will it be commercial projects? One of the really hard things, at least at the time about, and you, I mean, you guys have a version of this at Amplitude and have solved it better than we thought we could, honestly, but was a lot of these tools are, hey, step one, ship me all of your data. Step two, I'll do interesting things and give you back some insights, right? And when we talk to people and they'd be like, wait, 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 I don't want to step you. I don't like step one. Like, don't want to give you everything. Like, what are you talking about? We're going to build this in-house um, because even if it doesn't make sense from like an engineering cost perspective, from a risk adjusted, we ship everything to someone, to, to random people on a couch, feels better. Anyway, so that one sort of X that one out. On the team collaboration tools, uh, I sort of got to a point where I was like, man, I can tell you all the problems with these tools. I don't know how to solve them. And someone smarter than I am will solve them. Like, I think there are stuff to be built here, but I don't think I'm the person. Um, Is that, was that the kind of like conundrum where you know too many of the problems from experience? Yes, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, you know, and yeah, I just got, I mean, specifically I got to like so much of it's people problems, right? Like, did you read my document? Did you look at my document? Do you understand my document? Like, why didn't you emoji react to my document? And like smoother emoji reactions are helpful, but like, oh boy, <laughs> like there's a lot of people stuff going on there. Um, so yeah, like very, very in my own head about that one. And then on the security side, so again, we started with how can we get people to prioritize the locking of the doors and windows? got to compliance as the way to get people to prioritize. Like, here's the carrot. And so that's when we were like, okay, step one, get someone secure. Step two, prove it to them. And they're gonna initially be in it for the proof, for the SOC two, for the whatever, but like, we're gonna make it good. And so then, so we kind of got to that point two months in, then I was like, okay, great. Well, what's a SOC two again? Like, what is this thing? Yeah. Um, so that's when the spreadsheets came out. We did SOC two gap assessments for a few companies mostly see, trying to convince ourselves we actually could make a reasonable spreadsheet and they'd accept it honestly then we got to like okay yeah we can make these spreadsheets and wow do people like them also wow it's just so much to build <laughs> like oh god so then we had a brief like oh do we have to go talk to everyone can we give them a vanta badge like come on like i don't want to build all this stuff especially because a bunch of it's kind of nonsense off the record um Realize no, people really wanted SOC 2s. And so that's when they're like, okay, heads down. Like we actually then was like, if we can build all this stuff, people will want the product. It is just a like execution building risk thing. And then you're like, okay, that's a risk. I feel comfortable taking on. Like it's not market risk. I'll take that one and went. So take a step back. You said a couple of things, which is interesting was that security is the thing that's like 20th on your list. And that's why it's a problem. Um, but when they say you're building a startup, you want to focus on the thing that's the number one problem for that person. Yep. How did you, it sounds like maybe if I'm interpreting correctly, the problem in and of itself was that it's number 20 and you're trying, but people think it should be number one. Is that the thing? Or did you find someone for who it was number one? Kind of, so a little in between. So we were basically like, it's number 20 and this is like, means it'll be a bad startup for all the canonical startup advice, but like kind of like, that's actually much of making fun of it. It's kind of a good trope. And so we're like, okay. And I could say a lot of security companies run around and basically try to berate people in their marketing to making it number one. You will be an idiot if someone finds out you should buy our software because we are smart. Like right here, or a breach just happened. You don't want to have that happen to you. So buy our software. We're like, don't love that. Sounds not great. Yeah. So then it was like, okay, can we find someone sort of for whom it's number one? Or like, how do you transform it in a different way than just pleading? Um, 
And this is where the compliance piece came in. It was like, oh, it's number 20 until it's until I'm trying to sell to Google. And they ask me if all of the laptops at my company are encrypted. And I have no clue, but I turn around and buy software that tells me that the next day. So you and found so that the burning need comes at events and events, yeah. the inciting events tends to be when they're when they are trying to sell to someone who needs exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's when it was like, ah, you know, security company masquerading as a compliance company, joking, but actually serious, right? Like if you can take the compelling event and build something and build something real around it. Um, what about that? How do you, for those who are less familiar with the security space, how do you distinguish between security versus compliance? Yeah. So, okay. The way we do it internally is security is actually securing things, right? Are things in good shape broadly? There's, you know, hundreds of thousands of ways to answer that question, but whatever, it's stuff in good shape. Compliance is about demonstrating your security. And so you're not, you're not necessarily right. secure, but you might No, be. but like, and you should be demon and the, like, again, core belief of Vanta, you should be demonstrating the security you have. You should not be demonstrating security you don't have or like things you don't have, but actually, um, uh, and so we kind of talk about it as like securing things and then demonstrating that they're secured. Got it. Um, so back to kind of like, I want to go into like motivation behind working in security and then dive into the deeps of what it means to work in security. Um, you mentioned that this has to, the problem that you work on has to be something that you can like recruit someone for. Security traditionally has been even more specific compliance just sounds very unsexy and I'm like, <laughs> yes. um, like, how do you, how did you get motivated about it? How do you inspire your team about it? Um, what, what made it interesting to you as a problem once you identify that it is a problem? Yeah. So a few parts. So one, one part, actually another part that was like, oh yeah, we should start this company, um, was just learning how compliance works today. I mean, pre Vanta, but which is you write down a list of all the security rules you want to follow. You generally take screenshots that say you follow them. So you're like, does everybody have two factor? Sounds good. I'll take a screenshot of the you know, GCP or like G Suite admin dashboard. And then once a year, you show all those screenshots to a CPA, like an accountant. And the accountant's like, oh yeah, you have great security. Here's a SOC 2 report, <laughs> right? Like, and I mean, I'm kind of being dramatic, but like not actually. And just learning that and being like, okay, yo, like this is not gonna be how we think about the security of software in five years. Like it's just absurd, like it's just not. And like, someone's gonna fix this. And then you're like, what about us, <laughs> you know? But there actually was a part where you're like, oh, this just doesn't make any sense. So the motivating fact was that you felt you hit upon something that no one was really trying to solve. Yeah, and you're like, and again, actually, I so I do like the why now question for startups. Vanta does not have a good why now. Like ostensibly started 2017. Could you start Vanta in 2007? And eh, maybe not enough APIs. Could you have started in 2013? Totally, totally. I think to your point, like compliance does not sound fun. Um, it is not a thing. And so kind of engineers didn't really look at it, right? If you, if you were an engineer or a product person and you heard like, hey, you have to get compliant and you're like, uh, can I have another project please? <laughs> like I'll do the like SSO ad enterprise features instead, thank you. Um, and so no one had like really looked at it. It's not quite true, but like most people with an engineering or product background hadn't really looked at the problem. It, that's my best point now. Um, yeah, I have a friend who's a pretty successful investor. He says his, most of his thesis is around big, bold ideas that make total rational sense, but due to some weird pedagogy or something, just people just don't do. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, which is one of his reasons for investing in cannabis startups. But like, mm -hmm. um, this sounds somewhat related in that, like, just some weird reason no one wanted to touch it. Yeah. Know? I would say the other part of both, I mean, company mission and recruiting, but like deeply built on purpose, built into the fabric of the company is like this idea that more companies should be more secure than they are. Prioritization is tough. And so something that gets you to change that prioritization, even if you have to word, use the word compliance, is actually a good thing, right? And so like the company mission is secure the internet and protect consumer data. And like, you're like, how do you best do that? And it, the thesis is like, compliance for a while, yeah. um, even though that sounds a little goofy, I know, but like kind of to your like overly rational, like this is the overly rational way to get there. Um, and so, you know, that's helpful in recruiting, but it's, it's all, again, also just like baked in the company mission. It makes sense, yeah. Um, so getting to like the actual product itself. So solving obviously compliance <laughs> innovation is very challenging. Um, and a problem in, in any startup is building an MVP. Um, uh, I think 
we, my company, Eric and I company, um, we were in the same YC batch with Christina. We were I think, one of the first MVP users of Vanta. <laughs> I think it was very different than what it is now. Um, but how, how, like for something that like has very high risk yeah. in terms of what the customer expects, I mean, it's not healthcare, but it's still pretty high risk. Yeah. Um, like how do you build an MVP in this type of, how did you approach building your MVP uh, mm-hmm. to validate like the product that's going to meet the problem that you identified? Yeah, so a few parts. So I mentioned like the spreadsheets we made and the spreadsheets were gap assessments. So like, here's all the stuff you need to do for a SOC 2. And then, hey, company, friends company we walked into, like, here's how you're doing against it by hand. Um, and so the early versions of the product, which were quite bad, um, somebody else in the YC batch called it the brutalist white website, um, which was... Um, I actually thought it accurate. was like, <laughs> I thought that was part of its like intentional design, but I don't know. It was intentional in that I'm not a good designer and I've learned to like component libraries, like black on white, like don't get fancy with your colors, like don't don't mess it up too much before you get someone in who knows actually what they're doing. <laughs> so it's yeah. intentional in that sense. <laughs> yeah. Having having tried to design stuff in the past and failing, have learned to just like that is not valuable <laughs> effort that I spend. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we had those spreadsheets. Um, and then it was just turning the spreadsheets as much as possible into code. And honestly, the first version was uh, we can, you know, like here's the stuff you're supposed to be doing. Like that's easy with code. How are you doing against them? And all through, I mean, honestly, all through the first part of 2018, not just YC, that was increasingly powered by code, but there was sort of a spectrum of like how much was code doing this and how much was like Christina doing this behind the scenes. And like that, you know went from zero and a hundred percent respectively, like changed over time. Um, but there was a bunch of that, uh, that was like kind of incrementally done. Got it. So you did things manually by hand and then continuously automated them as necessary. Yeah. How did you validate or know which parts of it? How did you componentize like what to build? Like also maybe just t- take a step back for the people who don't know, what does it mean to be SOC 2 compliant? I think that's where you started. Um, and then like, how did you decide which parts of that to kind of like automate in which order and yeah. like what was the conversation like to get to revenue as well yeah yeah okay so talk to really high level is again somebody has said your security was an accountant like said your security practices are good here's a bunch of detail on them what that looks like is you have about i don't know somewhere between 50 and 100 controls but these are the commitments we encrypt all the laptops everybody's to a fan their email we set up our firewalls reasonably stuff like this um, and so step one of one of these projects is like, go write your list of 50 rules. And by the way, don't mess it up. And so it used to be like, go get a consultant who's done this, who will write those rules for you. So that's kind of step one. And then step two is like, great, go do them all, right? And prove them and proving often meant screenshots. So that's kind of sock two. And then actually, right. And then you spit out this 60 page PDF. That's like, oh, look at all their rules and look at all the things they do. And they're so secure and like, big customer, you should definitely feel okay using their software. Roughly the process in a nutshell. So one of the things we did that has actually been extraordinarily powerful um, was we sort of standardized that list of 50 rules. And we're like, look, if you talk to a consultant or an auditor, they'll tell you every company is different. But then when you talk to like someone who works at the company or a security person, they will be like, Amplitude should protect its customer data probably in the same way Dropbox does if they're using the same technology, right? Like it's not like, oh, Amplitude has analytics and Dropbox has files and like absent the technology choices, you know, only one company should have two FA on everybody's emails, right? Like, no, there's just best practices. So in the process of building this product, again, one of the things we did was we just standardized that list. And then it was like, look, you can add, remove stuff on the edges, but like 80, 20 standardized. And that has actually been extraordinarily powerful from I mean, our product development, because like, oh God, there's enough complexity already. Yeah. Um, and from a like understanding piece, and it's like a little bit of commoditizing a SOC too, which means it's easier for startups to get. Cause you know, step one is not go do a book report with a $500 an hour consultant. Step one is like, go do the reasonable stuff. Um, so that was a decision early on. That was again, sort of obvious to us as like product people where we were like, can't support this complexity. Also, it's there for kind of a stupid reason. Um, yeah, whatever. Of course, you do it this way. 
but it has just had these really big ramifications moving on. Makes sense. Um, and then the revenue component, I think you, you guys have done pretty well uh, from what I can tell on uh, like ACV, ARR. Um, how did you figure out how to price this product? Um, you know, I think you were one of my phone calls. Oh, yeah. uh, like, uh, like how did you figure out how to price it? And then like, how does someone evaluate the value of this? Because the value is related to it's a binary event. Like how do you figure out recurring versus kind of like these type of things? How did you think about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we changed this over time. Okay, so originally, so I mentioned the spreadsheet, and then we like made the spreadsheet a web page that was mostly filled in by me behind the scenes typing furiously. But anyway, we did that for like 10 startups, I think, and I think Clearbrain was one of them. And we're like, okay, here's your pretty web, like here's, well, hold on, so pretty, here's a moderately not terrible looking web page <laughs> that has all this information. Go try to use it in your sales process. Um, and then I, you know, and here's some I don't know, here's maybe an email about that. It probably wasn't actually that much. Um, then I called up those 10 folks and everyone would talk to me and ran through the set of questions, somewhat inspired by the like monetizing innovation pricing book, which I actually really like. Um, but it started with just like, what is Vanta? Like, what did I give you? <laughs> what do you, and like had people explain to me what the thing was? It's actually was really helpful because people mostly, one explained it the same way and two explained it the way I wanted them to. Yeah, I think actually, I'm, this was actually really confident, inspiring. I was like, oh, yeah, I think, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm remembering Brandon Eric's on the call as well. I think he might have been the one yeah. you interviewed. Uh, Eric, do you remember? I think it was that like we said that I think you were trying to sell us on like this thing we didn't sell on our laptops that like we're currently oh, yeah, yeah. Where we, like, like, no. like, <laughs> But I think we said the primary value that we got was just this binary event of like all the documents. Yeah. Um, oh, the policy docs. Yay. Policy yeah, docs, yeah. yeah. And we kept uh -huh. reusing that. That was one thing. Um, yep. Eric, do you want to fill in what else we found valuable at that point? Uh, the automated scan of AWS, I thought was really yeah. novel and valuable as well. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. It was, it's a really cool service overall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So people explained it and then it was like, cool. Like, did you use it? Did you try to give this to your prospects? Blah, blah, blah. And then monetizing innovation. What's a reasonable price an expensive price and a prohibitively expensive price to pay? For what I just gave you. And people said words, but they generally triangulated at about like $10,000 a year, a thousand a month, probably a little bit lower. But it was basically like, oh, <laughs> what are you flipping serious? <laughs> like, you can't believe, you know, my janky white webpage is like worth this. But two, like, cool, sounds good. Um, and so again, it was like a little aggressive. Like it probably came in like eight, $9,000, but was like, okay, cool. I guess I'll start with 10 and see where it goes. Um, so is it a flat was, fee per company or does it scale to volume for any reason? Or? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so it didn't scale to volume because I was like, I don't deal with this, whatever. We'll deal with this later. Or like ostensibly, yeah, I'll try to charge a big company more, but like I'm just talking to baby startups. Yeah. To this day, Vanta's pricing doesn't scale to volume, <laughs> which is something we're now fixing. Okay. But actually Vanta's pricing, we literally haven't looked at it since late 2017 which is in some ways a badge of honor, like hasn't been the biggest problem. And in many ways, it's just horribly embarrassing because like, oh God. So how did, so as a business, like how do you make, so that's one of the things they don't say with companies is like, you want a company that continues to grow with the customer or- <laughs> Oh yeah, net revenue retention is real. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, um, and so like, is your revenue basically just still those binary flat fees um, at these inciting events? Um, or do they come back to it every new evaluation they have to do? How does it work? Yeah, so, okay. So, I mean, slightly more advanced, not really, but slightly more advanced than how, I, how I'm letting on. So it's an annual subscription. Um, we used to also sell monthly. The churn rate wasn't different. And then hired the first salesperson who's like, I'm going to stop selling monthly. And you're like, cool, sounds good. Now we don't do monthlies, um, which is part of how we were able to grow so much without raising. It's just the cash flow dynamics from that are incredible and very real. But anyway, annual subscription, roughly based on headcount, but it's sort of headcount bucket. So we go to you and you're like, oh, you're 100 people? That's $17,000. Anyway, right? And then yeah. someone signed the contract for that much. And so then on renewal, you know, ostensibly we should be like, oh, now you're 200, would like to charge you more. But we just haven't had the CSM bandwidth to do this. <laughs> and so we're just like, oh, you want to renew? Wonderful, great. Okay, anyway, anything else we can do for you? Wonderful, thanks so much, bye. Um, which again, is like sort of cool, but also uh, uh, many opportunities for uh, improvement. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, so I guess getting to that point that you said, like you 
kind of didn't need to raise because you had a lot of cash flow coming in. Also, like, and compared to a lot of other startups, you didn't make a huge splash coming out of YC. Um, yeah. You kind of like just kept selling um, independently. Was that intentional? Um, and like, why was that beneficial in that context? And then why did you decide to come out of stealth with a massive kind of like raise going forward? Yeah, yeah. So it was intentional. And so, but the reason it changed. So initially it was like, can we actually get people sock twos? I mean, we think we can. We like to tell ourselves we can, but we've literally never done it. Um, and so it was like, oh, don't want to actually, I mean, did sort of my fundraising go around SOMA and be like, we will sock to all the startups. And, you know, people had different reactions to that. But one reasonable reaction people had was like, so have you done one? And we're like, no, not yet. <laughs> anyway, so there was a little bit of like, we used to joke, we didn't want to be benefits. of like, hi, you have the health right. insurance. JK, you don't have health insurance, sorry. Um, and then and we the got to a point. Average <laughs> so two takes like months or a year or something. Yeah, it can take up to a year. So actually our first one, um, I flew to the auditor we worked with in Colorado, sat with him. Like in some ways didn't actually need to do it at that point, but you know, yeah. it was the first one. So definitely did. That was Thanksgiving of 2018. Okay. First customer did not know they were the first customer until later. Because <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to be first. Yeah. Um. So that was the initial impulse. And then we got good at them. And then we're like, oh, this is actually a really good business. And most people still think we're in this random backrot water of alphabet soup. Great. And so then it was like, yeah, let's stay quiet and just grow because I don't want 14 competitors. Um, and so that took us a while, but then like word did get out and now there are some knockoffs. And so that actually motivated some amount of the coming out party was actually just like, Oh no, like, yeah, it's Vanta and, you know, it's like Vanta and, you know, these knockoffs like are not equally sized. <laughs> we are much better than anyone thinks, much bigger than anyone thinks and much better at this. And so that's what motivated the splash. So the, the re, one, one, so the two reasons for stealth was A, to operate with integrity that the product more or less worked. Yeah. Um, second was the barrier to entry was maybe lower than maybe other kind of companies. And yeah. so- it's mostly based on like your reputation and the like repeat. And you, I mean, you have to build a lot, but yeah. you can build, one can build a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. makes sense. That's, that's interesting. Um, and then what would you say, like what's unique looking back about, so you've done like multiple types of companies, you did Dropbox Paper, you did other things before. What's different about Vanta from either a product development cycle um, or product culture as well? Oh. Um, it's complicated. There's just a ton of surface area. So you sort of mentioned this, but we cover everything from like the state of employee laptops with or without an agent or an MDM to the state of cloud infrastructure accounts to Eric's point to employee processes to like blah, 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 blah. Like we just build a lot of product and a lot of stuff and have a lot of surface area because again, the lasso around it all is what do you need for one of these certifications? Um, and so you know, Vanta is, it's just kind of giant, giant cornucopia of stuff. And there's like complexity in that. And there's complexity in investment. What do you invest in relatively? How deep do you go? Oh, you have this agent. Some people, do you like try to take the agent out market with you? Do you say, no, just like you're going to use Jamf anyway. Anyway, like all of those questions, like product portfolio questions we have in spades and have had since the early days. Um, I think another part is customers pay us. We sell two startups. Um, but for everyone who wants one of these audits, we're working with an auditor. We introduce startups to auditors. The, there is no money change exchanged between us and auditors. Customer pays the auditor. But the, and I kind of for a long time did not want to build auditor product because it was like, we got enough product to build. And like, these people are getting a lot of money. Like they can scrounge for themselves. More intelligent, but like that was sort of the TLDR. And uh, that was not the right answer, I think, because the auditors have such a huge impact on the customer experience. And so we sort of have two masters, right? And again, so it's just a prioritization, like how do you balance these and make investments where you're like, the end goal is still the customer, but we have this third party in the mix too. You had to, to solve the actual customer's problem. You had to work with another party that's in like- <clears throat> that We do not I, control, yes. Yeah, so that actually goes to a little bit, I think of like, you made the example to Zen the analogy to Zenefits in some respect, like they had the company and then the insurance provider and right. they were effectively the person in between to complete that entire journey. Um, let's use Gusto. They're the better, nicer yeah. these days. Uh, and then, uh, and so it sounds like you had to 
look at the entire product development. It's not just about the customer. It's about everyone who the customer uses and figuring out how everything plays together. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Um, cool. So we'll open up for questions now within the audience. Um, uh, folks, uh, feel free to put a comment in, in the chat and we can read it out as well, or feel free to raise your hand and we will um, ask, you can ask Christina directly. Um, Jeffrey, you had a story. It seems like you wanted, are you still on the call, I think? Um, um, but uh, I think we may have dropped yeah, off. Here. Oh, cool. You want to ask a question based on our own story with SOC 2 or anything? Oh, uh, it's not really a question. It's just, you know, when you made the point of, oh, it's like at some point you're selling to Google and it's like, oh yeah, do, do you have this really important compliance thing? And then it's, you know, it was number 20 on your list and now it's number one. And uh, yeah, it would have been cool if we could have used Vanta back then, but you know, we got over it. <laughs> No real question, sorry. Um, I can jump in there and say it would be cool to be using Vanta now uh, <laughs> as opposed to whatever we were talking about. Uh, we're going through the, the pain of it right now. Uh, hi, hi, Christina, I'm Olivia. I, um, I, I, I'm, I lead security and IT. Uh, I'm bringing someone on board to start to manage this in-house very soon, so we'll be in touch. But uh, th I've never seen this before. This is really... Uh, innovative and I like it. What what are the future um, frameworks are you looking at? Are you ever looking at NIST, CSF or anything like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so today we're at SOC 2 HIPAA ISO 2701. Um, PCI is next and then probably oh. NIST 800, yes. Oh, that'd be nice, okay. Um, and then from there, potentially building into CMMC, but we're still, still trying to figure out how much CMMC actually exists versus may exist in the future. One, uh, one thought is that it would be, this may be slightly off your product path, but it would be really awesome. And I personally would love it if you could take the NIST 800 and roll it up to NIST CSF. And uh, pretty pictures uh -huh. that we can yeah, use. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, okay, yep. love it, fantastic, love it. I didn't realize we were going to get direct product feedback directly in the first. Oh, it was great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm in so much pain right now that uh, <laughs> I'm happy that Christina lives in this new world. <laughs> awesome. We'd love to talk to you when you're ready. I'll make the intro right after. So, um, uh, Eric, you have a question? Oh, yeah. I was just curious. Um, we we kind of took a different approach. We were trying to be very public all along, um, and you, you remained in selfish long. Did you face any challenges that were unexpected in that way? For example, recruiting or other things, what, what, what came up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, recruiting um, was fun. Uh, so recruiting was hard, right? Especially also in the early days when we like basically didn't even have a website. I mean, we did, but it said like Vanta and Times New Roman and said, you know, email us basically. Um, what is at Vanta.com? And so what would happen with candidates would Google us and be like, well, this isn't a real company. <laughs> Moving on with my job search. And so we ended up, it really, it really took a bit to realize that was happening, realize that was happening. It's like, okay, well, we don't want a product marketing page. Cause again, this was the era of like, can we even do the thing? Um, and so ended up investing more heavily in like what I guess I now know is called employer branding, but like Lynn, who is in our batch, key values, right? Like built out a key values page really early, like built out these like really shiny profiles on triple bite or, you know, whatever, just like trying to get candidates to at least engage with us. And then I think the other part of that was really leaning on some of our seed investors in the sell process to say like, yeah, yeah, I know Vanta's like website is written in Times New Roman, but it actually is a real company. Let me tell you how and why. So yeah, uh, recruiting was definitely challenging with that. I don't know, sometimes I feel like the, you either go one or two, like if you did your approach, it sometimes make you feel more serious. Um, because you're like not focusing on the flashy imagery and like it's like just like I forgot the word is but like more um aesthetic I guess and it's like I think sometimes it can be true advantage especially as a security company I'm not sure yeah um Haral, you had a question yeah um hi um, I was trying to um ask uh, this question is like you know looking back over the last kind of several years either forming mentor or even before that what is one thing you would do differently yeah, I mean, so many things, but any constraints on this, like in regard to any particular domain or generally? Uh, maybe starting the company. Cool. 
you know, I think we should have gone faster. I think we were both pretty scared of building something that people didn't want. And so did a bunch of diligence and like measured 14 times before cutting. And some of that was definitely helpful. Again, I spilled the microphone that dumps things into a Slack channel. Like that was measure zero times and cut. That wasn't the right answer. But I think we were a little more diligent and therefore kind of slow. It's not how we saw it at the time, but in retrospect, then we needed to be. Thanks. I guess, yeah, on that question as well, um, what would you say was, was your biggest failure over the last four years? Um, and what would you have done differently to obviate it going backwards? Um, really did not invest in CS, customer success until 2020. Um, in We had someone doing it in the early days didn't really realize what it, it was success and not support um, as a distinction I just didn't understand. What is the and distinction? Then, uh, proactive and reactive. I mean, it's more than that, but actually proactive and reactive. Um, so we replaced one part, but not the second. We replaced like the you know reactive part, not the proactive. And then just we were like wrong about, and then we're, then we're like, oh, but we don't need it because you know we have nothing to upsell. And that's what CSMs do. Wrong. Totally wrong um, for twofold. One, again, still kind of product that was being built out and two, uh, which you know gets better over time. And then two, the like, these audits are scary if you haven't been through them. And as jokey as I'm being about like CPAs and screenshots, like they are high, they can be high stress, high anxiety moments. And so just having someone there even being like, yeah, you got you, I checked, you're good. Don't worry about like you on this, like let's do a mock 10 minute call, you know, is just, it's so like kind of worth its weight in gold um, and just missed that. And so, uh, yeah, we were just like totally underinvested in CS for like actually kind of a really long time. Got it. Yeah. And so now you have success managers, I guess now. We do. Okay. Yeah. And now it's funny. So like, I mean, kind of the, like, we got you on the call 15 minutes. Let's go. We're like really good at one-to-one. -one. And now our issue is we like figured out that playbook and now you're like, cool. How do you scale this? Right. Um, so. How big is the company now? 80 people. Wow. Um, and <laughs> uh, that's exciting. Uh, I think the, any other questions from the audience? Uh, then I'll ask one last question for Christina. Um, what are the biggest thing, aside from like signing up to use Vanta, that would solve a lot of our problems, probably it sounds like, um, what, uh, what are um, some of the biggest mistakes um, that you feel companies make with compliance? Oh, that's good, uh, yeah. And, uh, and second, like, uh, do you have any last questions for us that you'd like to hear? Oh, yeah. Just um, cool, okay, mistakes. Um, so there's a little bit of like, okay, so actually one, uh, I think the, the divorcing, speaking Vanta's book, but like also kind of wrote this part of Vanta's book. So hopefully it doesn't come off as too insincere, but like one of like divorcing the security and the compliant pieces, right? Which can happen in like one of two ways. If you're like just doing the security stuff, I mean, in some ways better off, but your sales team is probably yelling about this. Um, more common mistake, I think, is divorcing the, you know, compliance from security stuff. And so being like, compliance is this nonsense, check the box process, never talk to engineering, just like, go put your project manager over there in the corner and like, they're going to go talk to auditors and whatever. You can do that. You're probably unlikely to, you know, talk through the actual security you have um, with, you know, that sort of wall built up. Um, but I think that is sort of a common failure mode. Um, I think on the general, and actually in the way we have the split internally at Vanta now, because we have more compliance focused people and then you know, security and security rolls up to engineering, right? And, and like security at Vanta is responsible for keeping customer data safe in the ways they choose to do that. And compliance is responsible for identifying like what frameworks we're complying with or we wanna go after, and then how we'll communicate what we're doing, right? But it's sort of like communication layer versus a like, go figure out what you, you know, go go in the corner, you know, do everything there, peace. Um, I think from an overall security perspective, there's, you know, just like the basics that sometimes it takes folks a while to get. 2FA, I've said it several times, it's like blatantly obvious, most companies do not have 2FA on everybody's accounts. 
email AWS cloud info, whatever it is. And like, that is just one of the things where it's like a little bit painful to set up and then just like hugely beneficial. Like it just prevents so much stuff going forward. Makes sense. Um, so last question, uh, question for us. Uh, we have some founders from Amplitude on the call. Our CISO is on call as well. Um, do you have any questions for us? Totally. Um, how, well, actually I have a product team question for you all. Sure. What sorts of things have you done that allow y'all to make decisions faster? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, or like identify which decision can be fast or slow is another way of putting that. But I'm gonna call my other product colleagues. Um, Abby, Haral, do you wanna give your thoughts on what's made us make decisions faster? I'll, I'll jump in though this go is a first. five minute. Oh, go ahead, Abby, go ahead. No, you go, you go, you started first. I was like, you've been here longer. Mine is a five month old <laughs> reflection. I think the, uh, the way we have our pillar and pod structure kind of helps us move um, slightly like different levels of decisions. Um, so for your context, like, you know, we have um, pods that are more ephemeral. So you kind of uh, like different areas that you want to focus on. And then pillars are more like areas of focus that are going to be multi quarter years. Um, so, and then it is like a engineering product and design lead working together on those pillars and they make decisions on their own. So that way it kind of moves much faster um, on the level of decision-making. Well, but Abby, you have your- uh, I was actually gonna say something quite similar, but more, yeah, like I think focused on the process side too. There is no, um, even as we've scaled, there's some things that are consistent across these teams. Like we're all using Jira, of course, or like we're all using certain things in common. But one thing I say is that like, all of the process is pretty iterative at every level. So even after every quarterly planning session or just even on a, on a pod or pillar level, we're constantly just iterating on our process and changing. And so I think that iterative culture, I actually came from less, we, we moved slower on the iterative process side, I think, in a lot of ways. And so that iterative process at the smaller stage, um, even as we scale, has been uh, really helpful for making decisions faster. I think you cut out, Abby, but you were saying you worked at Dropbox, right? No. Oh, yes. I Sorry, I was saying that it just the iterative process is, um, helps a lot. Whereas it, when you're in a much larger company, um, it's much harder to iterate, iterate on process on a quick basis. Yep. Uh, the, uh, I think, yeah, time, time that a little bit. I think something that, I think a couple of things, we made some research changes on this, on this as well, is that um, we used to have a quarterly planning process. Um, we've moved to like a rolling quarter process. Mm -hmm. um, so that saved, I think, a bit of time and having to like get all these people into the room and do massive planning. It's, it's definitely more iterative. I think we reevaluate like company priorities on a quarterly basis still, um, but the product development roadmap itself is more iterative, like Abby said. Um, uh, I think another thing we do well is um, uh, a kind of like product and, and leadership kind of setting objectives um, and de just delegation as much as possible. And on our team, like we delegate a lot to engineers uh, that makes decision-making faster. Like it also makes it, I think the having more vague um, objectives, like specific mm -hmm. metrics, but like vague missions okay. allows the team to iterate um, and not be tied to one solution. Um, but as long as the metric that we're trying to aim for is clear and whatever we build kind of like throw it out there, see if it works, iterate, throw it out there again. Like we just had a product launch, um, a big product launch took a month and a half ago. We launched with like three or four features. Um, we put a lot of energy on one of them. And then we didn't realize that actually everyone was using another feature. Um, yeah. And so now we've doubled down on that. And that's actually where all the sales have been starting to come in. Um, and so, but had we not, and that actually feature came in we finished that feature like six hours before we launched and announced the product. Um, <laughs> so like it was rushed in and like we had to, but it was getting to that point, but we were so glad that we did because we tested it and it actually had more positive reception than like another feature that we thought was gonna have more reception. 
it's like trying multiple bets um, with as minimal effort as possible. And then, uh, and then the last month we're like, oh yeah, we punt in all these other features uh, related to improving that feature, but that was what we needed to do to get it out by launch. So really ruthlessly focusing on like what's actually necessary to validate assumptions rather than building the whole thing. And that's been really helpful as well, so. Yep. How do you reinforce that culturally across, well, this team and then your all's teams? Um, so we're like many different product, like her all said we're different pods or product pillars within the company. It's a 90, 100, 110 person org. Uh, uh, there's four or 500 people in the company overall and like about 100, 110 people in, in product. Um, how to reinforce the culture. So we have a product ops function Mm. Um, that helps a lot. Um, so I know uh, Abby could probably speak to what was it before Shintaro and after Shintaro? Would you kind of say that there was a difference there in that context? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's helped to reinforce a lot of the processes and kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. I think, I don't know, I, I think um, everyone has always asked, how can we be doing this better? like at all levels, I think. And so I think product ops helps operationalize that culture, but I have always felt that, you know, on the team level, on the pillar level, on the, you know, leadership level, we are constantly asking, like, is this meeting going well? Is this process going well? Like, please tell me how we can change it. And so I think that culture um, like kind of pervades throughout the PD organization. And then I think product ops has helped formalize that culture. Um, and make it a lot easier to make changes and streamline. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Um, well, thanks, Christina, for, for joining and, and thanks for having us reflect on our product processes. Um, the, uh, uh, but yeah, thanks for, for joining in. And um, yeah, we'll have this recording live uh, online. Um, so we'll share it within the team uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, Christina, let us know if there's anything else we can do to help. Um, and thanks for joining uh, and talking to us about your journey. Well, dude, thank you so much for having me. And Happy Monday, everyone. Wonderful yeah. weeks. Take care. Bye. Cool. Thanks.